My name is Devin Calder and I work for the Atmospheric Fund and today I'm going to be talking to you about the heat pump, heat pump retrofit opportunity for electrically heated multi-res buildings in Ontario. So just a bit about who TAF is. So the Atmospheric Fund is a non-profit agency of the City of Toronto. We were created back in 1991 and for the purpose of investing in GHG or greenhouse gas emission reduction solutions for urban areas. Uh, in addition to the investing and granting activities that we engage with, we all also conduct a number of different research activities. And I am involved in the, uh, I am the TowerWise coordinator, and I lead, help lead the research uh, arm for uh, looking at solutions for energy efficiency in the building sector. And over the past several years, I've been focusing on a research project looking at how do we scale up adoption of heat pumps in the electrically heated MERB sector. So our research to date has gotten a lot of attention from, from various stakeholders. So we've been fortunate to gain a a federal and provincial funding from the Natural Resources Canada, from the IESO, and from FCM. We also have a, a, a comprehensive, we have a, a large team of in-kind supporters, various stakeholders, including our friends at DXS, uh, Toronto Hydro, and Electric Utilities providing in-kind support in the form of technical expertise. DXS is on our uh, advisory group that helps steer the, the work that we do in this for this research. And uh, we have uh, a, a team of 12 people that are on that advisory group. So TAF has identified heat pumps as a, a, a key to achieving a low carbon future in Ontario. Uh, they are not just an energy efficient technology, as some of you may know, but they also leverage uh, renewable energy. So we see this as a key technology for reducing energy for heating and cooling in the multi-res sector, and which is why from our research and experience, we are supporting uh, both research and demonstration of retrofitting this type of technology into the MERB sector. So from our market research to date, we've identified that 24% of the multi-res stock in Ontario are electrically heated. And so this is significant because we see from comparing electricity use in gas heated MERBs and electrically heated MERBs that the electric heating portion is significant compared to any other time of the year. And so what we found from our research is that on average, an electrically heated MERB or EMERB is using roughly 52% of its total electricity use just for space heating. And so we see that as a significant savings opportunity to bring in something like a heat pump to help reduce that. So from our estimates, we've identified that for the entire EMERB sector, that equates to roughly 2,400 gigawatt hours per year, or roughly a quarter of a million homes is total annual electricity use. So we see that the savings opportunity that heat pumps can provide the EMERB sector is quite significant. So we've conducted a, a conservation potential analysis looking at the technical potential and achievable potential. And from our achievable potential analysis, we found that if a generous incentive was provided, uh, within 10 years you could see near half of the, the EMERB stock's electricity use for space heating being uh, abated. And that actually would equate to uh, and if and on the technical side, if you were to retrofit all EMERBs in the sector with heat pumps, you could see 2.5 million tons of carbon dioxide uh, abated. But right now, what we're seeing is only less less than one percent of the EMERB stock being retrofitted with heat pumps annually, and this is mainly due to barriers that the market is currently facing. So these barriers include financial barriers like high upfront cost, uh, perceived extended paybacks, uh, competing capital priorities, and within the, the, uh, the, the property owner and HVAC sectors, we see that there is a lack of awareness around this heat pump retrofit opportunity for EMERBs. Um, for the HVAC contractors, we see that perhaps there's a, a lack of awareness, limited capacity, or a lack of interest in driving this market opportunity. Um, mainly because Ontario has a legacy of conventional technologies um, like our, our gas heating and our, our electric baseboard heating that have dominated the sector. So more attention has been focused on more conventional retrofits or, or maintaining those existing conventional systems. 
Um, but the reality is heat pumps have been around for decades. They're a proven technology. They're recognized globally as a key technology that can help reduce energy, and both for heating and cooling. Um, so those perceptions of risk, which are continuing to be a barrier for the market, are, are just that, perceptions of risk. Because what we find is that the, the new technologies of today can actually meet the heating and cooling demands that Ontario EMERBs uh, require in a far more efficient manner than what's currently being seen. So how TAF is currently trying to address these barriers are through a number of activities. So to date, we've completed market research, as I've already talked a bit about. Uh, we've conducted feasibility studies on actual EMER properties, looking at what the retrofit technical and business case look like. Uh, we've conducted a conservation potential analysis, looking at what the energy savings potential and greenhouse gas emission reduction potential are for the sector. Uh, we've also, in addition to the research that I've spoken about, we've also conducted a, a large amount of stakeholder engagement with various industry stakeholders. And we found that there, uh, through that, we were able to identify barriers and opportunities to overcome those barriers. So we developed a series of recommendations for the industry and for government to help uh, realize this opportunity. We've also developed a series of tools and resources in the form of a retrofit guide and a business case assessment tool for uh, interested contractors that want to learn more about this opportunity and also property owners and managers. From this work that we've done so far, we look to build on this and, and this is helping us with our next phase of work where we'll be looking at not just the opportunity for retrofitting EMERBs with heat pumps, but also heat pumps as part of a deep energy retrofit uh, bundle. So, and how we identify deep energy retrofit is achieving 40% energy savings or greater which, as um, many of you may know, is, is currently not the norm. So going back to the tools that we've developed, the, the retrofit guide is, is not to replace any sort of detailed engineering work or consultation with a professional. It's more of a conversation starter, as is our other business case assessment tool. So this will give a property owner or manager a sense of an opportunity they may not have even known has existed. And so we'll go through this. If you can download this from the TAF website, and see what the, the various steps are at a high level as to what you can do to realize this opportunity. The same goes for the, the business case assessment tool. So the idea was to have the retrofit guide work in tandem with this tool. So that's this business case assessment tool is part of the first preliminary steps to assessing the opportunity. So it's a, it's a Microsoft Excel based tool that again tries to show you an opportunity you may not have been aware of. So, it won't replace detailed assessments or an energy audit, um, but what it will do is give you a sense of what the savings opportunity could look like um, and what the, uh, what the financial case could look like as well. Um, so we developed it to be a, a very user-friendly tool. Um, it's, it's got two modes, essentially, uh, a quick review to, uh, mode, which allows you to just put in a few uh, entry points about your building, so essentially the location and how many units are in your MERB. And that will basically spit out a report that'll tell you the retrofit opportunity and what financing might look like for your heat pump retrofit. The detailed review uh, is a bit more involved, not by much, but it requires you to put in your monthly electricity use data and it weather normalizes this based on the year of the data. Um, and so this is essentially what an engineer would do to, as a first step in an energy audit. So conduct a linear regression analysis, uh, associating the monthly data to your heating, the heating degree days for that year. Um, and so, and for those keeners that want to go beyond this, um, you can override the defaults that are uh, supporting the backend algorithms. So inside the retrofit guide, there's uh, uh, just some some helpful hints as to what could make your building a good candidate. So we've already hinted at the, the fact that if you're electrically heated and you have high heating bills, chances are it would be a good opportunity to look into. If you're an older building and haven't done a lot in the form of energy efficiency, that would also help your business case. But again, it's always recommended to talk to a professional about this. You can even talk to your local utility. The local utilities are offering right now free audits somebody from their conservation management team will walk through your building and will give you an assessment as to what kind of conservation opportunities exist. They may not highlight heat pumps as an opportunity, um, but if you ask them about it, I'm sure they will, they will talk to you about that and put you in touch with someone that has more technical expertise in that area. 
So getting back to the business case, now I, I mentioned that the financial barrier is a, is a barrier currently blocking the market. Um, I just want to state that from our research to date, we see that there is a potential um, to achieve up to 75% savings for your heating and cooling, uh, just for the heating and cooling portion of your electricity usage if you have an EMERB. Um, and I want to say that although there are buildings that don't currently have a strong business case for retrofitting with a heat pump and could use additional incentives or, or financing, there are many buildings in Ontario that currently have high heating bills and would have a strong enough business case to move forward with what's currently available in the market, both from the incentives that are available and the technology. And so just talking a bit, a bit more about the business case uh, and getting into a bit more about what we're looking at for our next phase of work. Um, the heat pump opportunity will provide you a significant savings on your heating and cooling portion of your energy load. But considering an additional measure to go along with that, bundling multiple measures as part of a simultaneous project will optimize your savings potential. And it's not necessarily a linear relationship where putting in uh, one, two, three measures is just straight addition. You can actually have uh, relationships that go beyond linear with your savings potential. Other things that can help with your business case are leveraging existing equipment in the building. So for instance, if, you're, if you have a building that has electric baseboard heating, but you have uh, a hydronic fan coil that's providing your building with cooling, you could leverage that hydronic loop and tap into an air to water source heat pump or a, a ground to water source heat pump. <clears throat> and additionally, um, so when the Green On program um, was, was said it was going to be uh, removed, um, that didn't really affect the incentives that are available for the market, for the MERB sector, because Green On hadn't yet rolled out its programming. So the, the incentive programs that are uh, available now and are still available can help improve your business case as well. So that's the Save on Energy program suite of uh, incentives. Um, there's a few options there to look at. Um, and there's a newer program called the Affordability Fund Trust program. And that is a program geared to sweet metered sites where the potential there is if, if a sweet metered customer has a utility to income net threshold of a certain level, they can qualify for the tier three of the program and get up to $15,000 in incentives for a heat pump retrofit. So whereas um, the heating and cooling program can provide you up to $4,000 if you're a townhouse, the affordability fund is not necessarily limited by the building type. And so with the uh, next phase of our work, we're going to be building off of the work we've already done. So we'll be conducting demonstration projects where we'll be actually implementing deep energy retrofits with heat pump as a major component of that retrofit package. Um, we'll be developing financing uh, recommendations as to what kind of innovative financing should be offered in the market to help EMER property owners uh, realize this opportunity. And we're also going to be showcasing how best to go about evaluating the business case. So considering things beyond the energy benefits and looking at the net energy or the non-energy benefits as well. Um, and also taking into account some of the more conventional uh, investment metrics that are out there but aren't necessarily being used for energy efficiency uh, business case analysis. So net present value, internal rate of return, these kinds of things can be used to actually showcase uh, a, a heat pump retrofit in a more favorable light than simple payback may just do on its own. Um, also considering the incremental costs. So many buildings already have a capital expenditure plan in place and so they're already planning to spend money on HVAC upgrades and other upgrades in the building. So considering that the additional nominal expense to put in a more energy efficient system or component is actually not that much in the grand scheme and will actually provide you uh, in the long run a greater benefit uh, with, with energy savings. From the demonstration work, we're going to be developing uh, measurement and verification guidelines to simplify and help streamline uh, for the market. Uh, best practice approaches to measuring the performance after a heat pump retrofit. And we hope from that that it'll help actually inform new incentive programming that the government and, and utilities could roll out. Um, and also the, uh, the, the, the scale-up strategy, which will ultimately showcase a roadmap, a path forward on how do we ultimately overcome the barriers to, uh, to heat pump adoption and also deep energy retrofit adoption. 
So we've started to partner with four sites in the greater Toronto Hamilton area. So these sites are a range of building types and ownership types. So townhouses, low rise apartments, uh, high rise apartments, um, high rise condos, uh, and different types of heat pumps are being recommended for these, uh, these retrofits. Um, and the goal here is that the heat pump will be bundled in with a number of other measures to achieve a whole systems approach retrofit design uh, that'll achieve 40% or greater energy savings and greenhouse gas reductions. And the scale-up strategy will, again, as I've said, build off of what we've already done with our research and try and showcase to the market what can be done to build capacity for various stakeholders, property owners, managers, HVAC contractors, uh, showcase the financing that is required based on feedback from the, from the industry, um, showcase what kind of programs could help roll this out further for those particular properties that don't already have the business case now, um, and what kind of solutions uh, from policy could overcome most, if not all, the barriers. Um, and then just to recap, we see that this opportunity of heat pumps is crucial to achieving a low-carbon future. It's, uh, it's going to help with paving the way, not just for EMERBs and new builds, but also trying to pave the way for reducing energy, uh, energy and greenhouse gas emission reductions for natural gas uh, heating and building. So right now, the market uh, conditions are that the, the cost disparity between electricity and gas make it less of a strong case. Now, again, it's on a case-by-case -case basis, but on average, less of a strong case to retrofit with uh, a heat pump if you're a gas-heated building. Um, I think my friends at DXS can talk a bit more about that um, as to where it makes sense. Um, but ultimately, what we're finding is that the, the barriers are not insurmountable if, if there's the right solutions put in place. Uh, and we're showing that evidence from the support that we've already gained and from our continuing stakeholder engagement that there is a lot of top-down and bottom-up support for this type of opportunity. And uh, we will continue to work with stakeholders to try and transform this market. So that's it. Thank you very much. Do we have time for questions? Uh, we'll save, we'll, we'll we'll save it for the end? Can, yeah, okay. we can ask it. Okay, thank you. So I, I'm Eric. I'm from DXS. I work on the engineering side, so that's mostly the technical side. So I hope I won't bore you with all the details about heat pumps. Uh, we'll go through a bit of a technology overview. We'll talk about inverter technology, air source heat pumps, how we use those heat pumps to keep heat in Canada's climate. And we'll talk about two different types of systems that, that we use uh, to serve those heat pump purposes, which are decentralized being mini and multi-splits, and then a more centralized solution being that the larger VRF systems. So inverter technology. So the simplest way to think about inverter technology is you take a simple on-off system, which allows your set point in the space, meaning the temperature in the space, it fluctuates a lot as the system kicks on and it cools for a while, and then it'll turn off and the space heat back, heats back up. And as we sort of uh, change the modulation time of where the, the time off versus the time on, we try to leave it continuous as possible, then we can achieve a, a, a sort of a, the technology, the invert technology that allows us to maintain temperature as close as possible to set point. So we eliminate that on and the off, and that actually allows us to run far more efficiently. So the inverter technology is, is what allows the compressor in a heat pump to run most efficiently. And so in an air source heat pump, that compressor allows you to have a uh, very efficient heating and cooling at the uh, indoor <coughs> unit. So a heat pump, if you're familiar with a typical sort of AC system, your, your split system with an outdoor condenser on your house uh, and your indoor evaporator coil, a heat pump is similar to that, but instead of just being able to do cooling, it can also do heating. So we're actually drawing heat out of the air outside, and we're transferring that through the use of energy input at a compressor, uh, and we're actually able to transfer that heat to the indoor coil. And now we can heat our space just using electricity, as opposed to uh, using a furnace, which is using gas, and, and here we're interested in reducing our greenhouse gas emissions. Um, and so one of the questions here is, how do you actually do that? Um, if we're using electricity to heat the building effectively, then isn't it the same thing as electric baseboard heat? The reality is with a heat pump, you're actually able to heat up to two, three, or even four times as efficiently as you would be able to with electric baseboard heat. That's because we take advantage of what we call the refrigeration cycle in that heat pump cycle. And so we can end up with COPs in this sort of complicated graph here, 
showing COPs of around three, even on our average winter temperatures. And even down to our coldest design days, we're still well above two. And really, all you need to get out of that is that our actual heating efficiency is two, three, four times as efficient as it would be if you're just using electric baseboard heat. That's where the emission savings and the electricity savings that Devin talked about of 25 to 75% of using a heat pump retrofit, that's where that all comes from. And one of the other fears about heat pumps is that, well, it's not actually reliable for heating. We have systems that can heat all the way down to minus 30 Celsius and still provide heating at those temperatures. So you are actually covered. Uh, it's not something that is just going to shut off when it gets cold outside. So decentralized systems and centralized systems. So the first decentralized system is uh, what we typically call mini splits or multi splits. These are the sort of simplest systems. This is as close as possible to that traditional AC system that you might have at your house with a couple improvements, including that inverter technology and secondly, the heat pump technology. So instead of just AC, now you can heat with that unit. These are typically one to one where you've got one indoor unit, one outdoor unit doesn't necessarily have to be a wall-mounted uh, ductless unit like we've shown here. There are ducted options and things like that. But uh, simply, it is mostly a one-to-one -one or two-to-one or three-to-one where you've got maybe up to three indoor units connected to one outdoor unit. And we'll talk about later on, we get into the design applications and, and considerations. We'll talk about when we use this decentralized solution versus the centralized VRF solution. So VRF is like taking a whole bunch of those mini splits and we combine all of those condensed units into one larger outdoor unit connected to many more indoor units, typically. So what is VRF? So like I said, we've got multiple indoor units connected to that one outdoor unit. And we transfer refrigerant around the space. And that refrigerant passing through those pipes and going into those indoor coils is what allows you to transfer the heat from outdoor in heating, uh, in heating mode when it's cold outside, transfer the heat from the outdoor air to the indoor units. So each indoor unit has a little expansion valve inside of it. That expansion valve meters the refrigerant passing through the coil, uh, which along with the inverter technology in the outdoor unit, allows you to maintain temperature in the space uh, as evenly as possible. Um, because those indoor units are basically just what we call fan coils, it has a fan and that expansion valve and the coil, uh, there's very little sound. That fan runs continuously, so it's not kicking on and off like you would in a traditional uh, single-speed fan in your home, uh, which also increases the occupancy comfort. And again, the compressors in the outdoor units are varial speed, and they're optimized for that part load efficiency, uh, and they modulate based off of the communication signal that's receiving from all those indoor units, telling it what, uh, what speed to run at. And you know these are very commonly used uh, in the commercial area, and we're starting to get them into uh, condos, and we're also looking at a lot of retrofit opportunities to use these air-cooled machines. There's two fundamental types. We talk about, they're both heat pumps, but we talk about changeover systems uh, and heat recovery or simultaneous heating and cooling systems. The first heat pump system is the sort of simplest VRF, uh, and there you have all your indoor units connected to one outdoor unit will be in one mode of operation. So they all have to be in heating, or they all have to be in cooling. And we're able to do a changeover so that switches between heating and cooling fairly quickly. It only takes a few minutes. But again, key thing to remember here is that it needs to switch back and forth, and that if you've got one zone that needs cooling and one that needs heating, they're not going to both be simultaneously satisfied. The system will have to switch back and forth. We can zone the system or the building so you have similar exposures on a single heat pump system. You could have your north-facing exposure be in heating mode uh, and a separate system serving your south-facing exposures uh, be in cooling mode. You can do that, but on the single system, it's going to be in one mode of operation. Just going to skip to the next slide. So the second type of system we have is what we call a heat recovery system or a simultaneous in heating and cooling system. So now what we've done, we've added an extra component, what we call a branch selector box in the middle there. And that allows us to, with, along with a third pipe, uh, which is a dedicated hot gas line, now allows you to have that heating independence. Uh, so you can have some units in heating and some in cooling. There's no real limit on how many units need to be in cooling and how many need to be in heating uh, for the system to function. 
but um, one of the key things here is that there's actually a transfer of heat, uh, which is why we call it um, a heat recovery system. Um, and so because of this transfer of heat, the most you can, or the highest efficiency you can get is when you have uh, different modes of, uh, of, or about equivalent amounts of heating and cooling at the same time. So in your shoulder seasons, in, as opposed to a heat pump system where you want to zone for different exposures, with heat recovery you want to do the opposite. Now you want to zone so that you have as many different exposures on the same system so that we can take as much advantage of heat recovery and therefore reduce uh, the operating cost of the system. Now, on to application design considerations. So when do we use one of those systems versus the other? What are the other things that are important when we're considering multi-unit residential building retrofits? Um, so first, talk about indoor unit selection. So lots of indoor units are available, um, and a lot of the decision here is going to depend on um, is going to depend on, on what the space is and how much um, sort of interference uh, and interruption there will be in that um, renovation. So typically, something like a ductless unit uh, is going to have the lowest cost to install because you're just hanging a single unit on the wall. Uh, on the other side, you've got ducted units, which is going to require drywall work and hanging work. So you've got increased costs there. On the flip side of that, a ducted unit could serve multiple spaces. So you could put one ducted unit in a space and serve the living room and uh, you know the bedroom or, or living room and two bedrooms or three bedrooms. Depends on the size of the system and how much you want to route that ductwork. Uh, on the going back to a ductless unit, if you want to use a ductless unit but you've got multiple spaces, you might end up needing. Uh, one wall-mounted unit in each space, and that can drive up your cost, uh, and it can also increase the uh, the piping cost and that sort of thing. So that evaluation is important, um, and 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 there's no right answer. It's all going to depend on the specific project. Typically, for multi-unit residential buildings that do have electric baseboard heat, uh, they don't have any of the sort of space to put a ducted unit, and so typically we see a lot of them going to the wall-mounted solutions. Um, Another thing is about tenant interruption here. So again, wall-mounted unit, very simple and easy to hang on the wall, and you can run your refrigerant piping maybe right directly outside. Uh, and this can minimize the interruption to the tenant. Um, and again, it might not require any drywall work. In terms of building size and floor layout, so uh, if we're looking at multi-splits, uh, the decentralized system versus the centralized VRF system, um, there's differences in terms of pipe lengths. So there's limitations on how far the outside condenser unit can be from those indoor units. Um, so if we're looking at, you know, typically our lowest cost, and I'll get to this in a little bit, but typically our lowest cost solution will be a multi-split or a mini-split solution, um, but there are a couple of considerations. So you need some space to put that outdoor unit. Typically uh, around 60 feet difference between that outdoor and indoor unit. If you have no space close enough for that condenser unit, uh, then unfortunately we're not going to be able to look at this multi-split solution. Um, and I mean, there's ways to get around that. You can find spaces mounted on the outside of buildings, uh, or you can take up a lot of your roof space, um, uh, in some cases with these uh, condenser units, but we don't always, again, have the line lengths to do that. If you've got a 10-story building, you can't put the, all the condenser units on the roof and serve those lowest floors with the decentralized system. We can, however, um, with a VRF solution. So here now, much more flexibility in terms of those piping lengths. We can run hundreds of feet between uh, the outdoor unit and the indoor unit. Um, and then we can take advantage of still using this air source heat pump technology, even for those larger, uh, like 20-story buildings and, and above even. Um, however, now that you've got all those pipes, uh, so you've got your outdoor units up on the roof, you need a place to root those pipes. So it might be on the outside of the building. We've looked at doing that in certain applications. Otherwise, you need some sort of pipe chase internal to the building next to your elevator shaft or something. You need space to run those pipes. And if it's a building that's electrically heated with baseboard heat, doesn't have any sort of hydronic system, it wouldn't have had the infrastructure to hold those pipes that you might be replacing with refrigerant pipes. So now you need to take space away from somewhere else. Uh, so that's all considerations, things to keep in mind when you're looking at a VRF solution. You need to have space to run those refrigerant pipes. Um, however, again, these outdoor units, uh, they are very large and efficient. Um, 
And so you can uh, do a lot of heating and cooling in a limited amount of space, and you don't need to build any sort of mechanical room or anything like that on the roof that, to house them. I want to talk quickly about refrigerant. Um, so one of the concerns with the VRF or, or our mini split solution is the refrigerant. Um, it's one of the sort of common concerns. So firstly, all VR systems in North America currently use R410A. R410A is a non-toxic uh, refrigerant. However, it is heavier than air, so a leakage can limit the amount of air available uh, that we need to breathe. Um, so CSA B52 takes this into account and has come up with a safe limit of 26 pounds per thousand cubic feet. And so that's basically the limit if all of the refrigerant in a system were to leak into one confined space, we need to meet that limitation. Um, and so what this means for us here is that um, it's typically that with that 26 pounds per thousand cubic feet, any mini split, multi split is going to have, you know, in the, the range of a few pounds, like five pounds maximum. So you're never going to run into this type of issue. VRF systems, um, we do, in some cases, uh, have to design creatively to get around that. We can't just do whatever seems like the optimal economical solution, uh, and we need to come up with ways in order to still meet CSA B2 and have a system that is uh, CSA B52 compliant um, and, and meet all the codes um, while still being an economically uh, feasible system. That's something that, that that's part of the service we provide. Um, and again, uh, as an extra note here, TSA does certify all these uh, refrigerant-based systems over five tons for air conditioning. Uh, so you have that as an extra sort of uh, guarantee. What about electrical? So um, there's differences between a, a decentralized and a centralized system in terms of uh, how we power these systems. So many, many splits and multi-splits, you've got one condensing unit serving one suite. Uh, if it's nearby, if it's on the balcony or something like that, it could often be powered by that suite panel. Uh, and now everything is easily metered, um, and uh, it, we only need one power feed for that condensing unit, which will power the indoor units. Fairly simple in that regard. On the flip side, BRF typically requires three-phase power, and that's going to be power you know, up on the roof. It's going to be in a centralized location. If you have an electrically heated building, didn't have any of that central power feed, you're going to need to find power or provide extra power to the building, something that Toronto Hydro or whatever utility are uh, can help you figure out. But you will need to, to supply that infrastructure in order to uh, power those condensed units on the roof. Um, additionally, you will need separate power for all of your fan coils in the spaces, uh, but those typically could be powered by your suite panel. Just a quick summary now in terms of the design considerations. So mini splits will usually be lowest capital cost. Uh, and there's only, there are very few situations where a VRF system will uh, be uh, uh, less expensive to install um, than any sort of mini split system. We've talked about the limitations of, of, of mini split systems and why we do use VRF in a lot of these applications. We require space near uh, near the suite for the outdoor unit. Again, on the balcony or mounted right outside, there needs to be some local space uh, for that condensed unit. Uh, there is a slightly limited selection of indoor units. Not quite as many indoor units are available with uh, the mini split solution as there are with the VRF solution. Uh, usually, the, the, what is available is enough for most applications. Um, and lastly, as I just mentioned, it's powered by the in-suite panel as long as it's close by, which has savings in terms of the electrical infrastructure. For the VRF side, VRF is often the most energy efficient option. Again, the reason for that is that you've got so many more indoor units uh, served by one outdoor unit. So that outdoor unit can run uh, most efficiently uh, as continuously as possible, sharing that load amongst, uh, for sharing the load of all the indoor units among one uh, optimized compressor. Um, this avoids condensing units on balconies. Uh, this might have some value in terms of the sort of real estate value of the space to not have a condensing unit on the balcony taking up space. Uh, there's a sound uh, associated with that and just the visual aesthetics of this place. Um, lower maintenance requirements, again, because it's not on a balcony and VRF is instead centralized on the roof and you might have uh, two condensing units instead of 20 mini split condensing units. Uh, there are savings on the uh, maintenance side. You don't need to enter someone's suite in order to do that regular sort of maintenance. Instead, it's in a, a, a space on the roof that has access for the, the qualified maintenance personnel. Uh, and lastly, power usage. Um, 
uh, again, that the electoral side of the, the condensed units on the roof that you need to provide that extra cost. Um, uh, one thing I did want to mention is that we can uh, do metering for VRF solutions. Uh, it is a little bit more uh, involved, and we need to work with a billing company to do that. Um, but there is a way to divide up the power usage of that outdoor unit amongst all the indoor units. Thank you, Eric. <clears throat> so um, I'm going to wrap up the presentation with uh, with just a couple of slides. Uh, before I get to my section, um, there's a, 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 a report that was commissioned by IESO. So if you look at the back there, Stephanie's holding up a report that you can get a copy of. Uh, so this was commissioned by uh, you know IESO in partnership with uh, the uh, government of Ontario. Uh, to basically recognize what the opportunity of retrofitting buildings with heat pumps is. And in that, uh, you know, they, they mentioned that in some cases you can get a payback between two to, two to, seven, uh, uh, two to seven years. Uh, and the, the key to remember is that whenever you're doing a heat pump retrofit, you're adding cooling to the building. Okay, so a lot of the electrical, electric heated buildings that we find right now uh, don't have a good mechanism to cool the buildings. Well, this solution basically gives you the ability to cool, uh, thereby increasing the value of your asset. So, so that is what they've taken into consideration uh, in terms of the, uh, the payback calculation. Uh, so, so like, I'd, uh, uh, you know, like I'd initially talked about, you know, typically what we see is that the install cost for a VRV system or a mini split ranges between $5,000 to $15,000 per suite. Uh, so you know, when, you, when you add incentives, uh, you know, some of the incentives that Devin talked about, you know, there's ways to reduce that financial burden, uh, you know, depending on what programs are available. Uh, you can, you know, you can reach out to, you know, myself, Eric or Devin to basically get more information about that. Uh, like Eric mentioned, uh, you know, uh, uh, you know, we, the systems operate typically with a COP of, uh, of three, um, and, uh, uh, and actually, the last point I wanted to mention is that, uh, you know, when you, uh, you know, with VRV systems, uh, you are reducing the operating cost of your asset, of your building, uh, which uh, increases the asset value. So if you take, if you take that into, you know, if you take the cap rate of 5% uh, into consideration, which is typical for City of Toronto, so essentially you're reducing your, you know, operating costs by a certain amount every month. Uh, you know, you can see returns on uh, on the um, the value of your asset instantaneously, and I'd be I'd be happy to talk uh, more about that uh, if there are questions. Um, so, in our experience, typically ten to twenty percent uh, of the overall project costs are what what are given back uh, in incentives. Uh, you know, non suite metered buildings, uh, the incentives are typically. Uh, 20 cents a kilowatt hour uh, for suite metered buildings uh, like Devin talked about there's a couple of different options you know either uh, you can get the uh, the heating and cooling incentive which is four thousand dollars per suite or you or the tenants have the option of applying for the the uh, home assistance program which can give up to fifteen thousand dollars back to the tenant per suite uh, specifically in the city of Toronto uh, there is a, a program that's available, and it's called the High Rise Retrofit Program, uh, and it, it it provides really attractive financing terms for heat pump retrofits. Uh, so, so you know, here's the here's the fixed financing terms that are available through the City of Toronto. And the nice thing about these uh, uh, these this financing term is that uh, this is not a credit line of credit that you're taking uh, against your asset. You know, this gets this gets added on to your property taxes. So essentially, the cost of your retrofit is just included in the monthly payment of your property taxes. So you can still continue to, uh, you know, if you need to, you can continue to borrow against uh, the asset, um, you know, any credit that you may need. And uh, that's all we have. Any questions, guys? <clears throat>